Good morning. Thanks for joining us for best management practices for fine fescue high grass areas presented by PBI Gordon and taught by Steve McDonald. My name is Lisa Wick. I'm the senior manager of e-learning programs here at GCSAA and will serve as today's moderator. A couple of quick housekeeping notes before I turn it over to Steve. We are recording today's event. You'll receive access to the recording as part of the follow-up email. Your audio is muted in this system, but if you'd like to ask questions, we encourage that. You can do that by typing into the question answer box or on your GoToWebinar tab, you'll see there's a little orange rectangle and at the bottom of that, there's a raise hand icon. You can click on that and that will let me know that you'd like to be unmuted so that you can ask a question. Also in that GoToWebinar control panel, you'll find the handout that we have made available for you today. Today's session is eligible for 0 0.1 GCSA education points. At the end of the program, we'll give you a code that you can use on the website uh, to log those education points. That has been made possible by our friends at PBI Gordon. With a full line of herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, growth regulators, and other products, PBI Gordon Corporation is a national leader in the professional turf and ornamental management industry. Today's instructor is Steve McDonald. Steve is the owner of Turfgrass Disease Solutions, which conducts research trials and serves as an independent agronomic resource for turf managers. He earned his bachelor's in turf science from Delaware Valley College and master's in turfgrass pathology from the University of Maryland. McDonald has taught courses in the Rutgers Professional Golf Turf Management Program and at Delaware Valley University. His research focuses on the management of problematic diseases, insects, and weeds, and the fertility of turf grasses. McDonald has taught both seminars and webinars for GCSAA. Please join me in welcoming today's presenter, Steve McDonald. Take it away, Steve. Thanks, Lisa. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to turn my, my camera off here and uh, try to focus on this. <clears throat> it's actually uh, pretty difficult to cover how in-depth fine fescues can be in an hour. Uh, you probably spend more like two or three hours if you really wanted to dive into some of this deeply. So I'm going to try to make this as concise as possible and try to get through all this information. So one of my major suggestions and concerns for high grass fescue areas, and, and I really encourage most golf courses to think about this, <clears throat> you got to consider what your purpose is, right? Is it to reduce mowing, which maybe with fuel prices the way they are and labor prices the way they are, maybe that's something you are considering significantly. Uh, maybe reduce the irrigation inputs if you're out in the, the southwest and, and irrigation water qual quantity is an issue. But many times I get pulled in the scenarios where this is an architectural feature and must be playable or it's considered in play. Maybe it's aesthetics or environmental, maybe reduce, trying to reduce other inputs. Is it a drainage area? Is it a buffering area or a pollen area? So when it becomes an area that you have to maintain as an in-play area, many golfers feel that these areas are just let go and they should be between a half and one shot penalty. Most golfers don't realize that it actually costs more per square foot with equipment, labor, to maintain these areas as in-play. So always considering your purpose is a really valuable start uh, when you begin the conversation of high grass fescue areas. One of the interesting things, and unfortunately in my consulting career, I've seen about 12 to 15 golf courses I've consulted for go, go under and go out of business. Whether they go fallow or they go into housing, one of the most thing, interesting things I've done is I take time to get back on those properties and walk them. This is actually uh, old Philmont Country Club uh, outside of Philadelphia. They had two golf courses there, one closed, I don't know, four or five years ago, and it's potentially going to be renovated into houses. But it's, it's impressive when you begin to walk these golf course sites, what just happens when you stop mowing them. And one of the things that we're trying to do in these high grass areas is trying to mow them as, as infrequently as possible, right? So the seed head grows during May and June. You want that, that seed head or that, that seed stalk present for the summertime months to get the wispy appearance, as well as potentially in the fall, if you have some, some warm season native grass, like little blue stem or andropogon, they're, they're very you know, aesthetically pleasing if you can allow them to stay you know, unmowed for the fall. So what ends up happening in many of these old golf course sites is you have weeds that will just take over. Here's Bermuda grass, you know, it's about, I don't know, ankle high and about three years of not cutting, right? So it's pretty obvious that weeds or undesirable plants, you know, will get a really quick foothold. 
And I teach a wee class at Rutgers in a two-year program. I oftentimes will ask the students in turf one, I'll say, where do you see more weeds at? In putting greens are mowed maybe 220 times a year or in your roughs, right? Mowed twice a week during the peak of the season, right? Most students are very quickly pick up on the fact that, yeah, we see dandelions and clover and plantain and wild violet in our roughs. We don't see those weeds in putting greens, right? So the big obvious difference there is species of grass potentially, but also the, the mowing frequency. The other thing I want to comment before I get into the, some of the, the nuances of these is not every soil is the same, right? So this is actually Friar's Head uh, on Long Island. And Bill Jones, you know, has a really awesome property there, but it's, it's basically dune sand, right? Many people don't know this, but there's not, not much drainage in this entire golf course. Basically, the entire property conforms to USGA spec sand, drains relatively rapidly. And they basically have, you know, these thin, wispy dunes areas that are created just by having a sandy soil in these areas. So it's very difficult to compare a site like this to, say, a, a site you know, closer to New York City, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., or out west, you know, Chicago area that has a, a finer textured soil, say a silt loam or even a clay, that's going to hold on to more moisture and the plants will never go under drought stress or get that wispy appearance, right? So we have seen some, some golf courses try to mimic this in some of their selective high grass areas where they'll, they'll, they'll pile, you know, a couple inches of sand and they try to establish fine fescues into those sandy areas. And that seems to work pretty well. But realize this is a, a large undertaking for these areas of the golf course. The other thing I'll mention too is, you know, the use of fine fescue in these mounds here, moguls on um, this golf course in, in the Northeast, this creates many specific maintenance challenges like hand spraying certain herbicides where you maybe have Kentucky bluegrass or ryegrass or, or fescues, tall fescue, up right against the fine fescue where you can't boom spray these. So definitely something to think about when you're thinking about installing these areas or maintaining them or trying to establish them from, from that logistical that concern. One thing I always see this, this is actually an edge of a parking lot that the superintendent put fine fescue in. It was one of the best fine fescue areas that I saw and it was all this really rocky soil, right? So if your fine fescue is not in play, this, this makes driving through them and actually made this a little easier because you're not worried about the, the seed stalks and, and the playability and the appearance of those. The other big consideration is the, the goals need to be defined. This is a fine fescue area that they had some daffodil and some forbs, right? And I was consulting the golf course and the question came up, they had some, some questions on herbicide use in these areas where they had some daffodils and a hard fescue. And the idea here was, you know, mow these bulbs down, you know, come, you know, after their bloom in April and then let the fine fescue go to seed. I thought this was a very interesting, you know, try to use that land for dual purpose. But the big question here is many of your herbicides that control broadleaf weeds like Canada thistle or dandelions or whatever you may have in these areas are going to also negatively impact the bulbs, right? So if those bulbs are going to stay in place long term, that's going to be a, a major consideration. So think about this, uh, basically, you know, a challenge for weed control in these, these dual purpose areas. Here's kind of an area that maybe many people would strive to have. You know, this is an area that's getting you know, two to three different herbicide applications per year, tank mixes of two to three different materials, as well as some plant growth regulators. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later here about the PGR use in fine fescues to, to try to improve their, their, their lodging so they don't lay over, as well as potentially reduce some seed heads. The other thing, when, when Lisa actually reached out to me, she asked me if I would talk about uh, fine fescue native areas. And I asked her if it would be okay to change the title because for me, these really are not natives, right? Fine fescues, you know, are really native to Europe. Basically, you know, native area is used a lot for these areas. And I, I believe it's kind of an incorrect term. And I realize why people say that, but um, it definitely something to think about is I call them fine fescue high grass areas. And people say no mow areas. Well, if it's mowed once a year, it's still mown, right? So the areas are mown. So what's a better term? That's why I came up with uh, either minimally mown rough or high fe grass fescue areas, right? So here's some, some of my other ideas here. Fescue areas may not be the best term because you could have little blue stem mixed in. Uh, environmental area, be careful with this term. And, and really, I have trouble personally defining these areas and whatever you use uh, is fine. But the reason why the title of this is uh, high grass areas is just that. So let's get into some basics of weed control in high grass fescue areas. This is going to be a site specific problem. And it's, it's interesting to travel in the country, visiting golf courses, you know, each different region and each different golf course could have different weed problems. 
as well as as we see shifts in weather, wet summers, dry summers, you know, hot summers, we could actually see a, a shift in the weeds. For example, American burnweed, which has become a huge problem in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, we really didn't see much American burnweed 10 years ago, or certain sedges, uh, green kalinga being one in particular. And then we begin to think about weed control. Can you logistically spray them? Are they on slopes? Uh, labor to do that? Uh, is there water close by as far as, you know, some of these buffer areas that many herbicide labels have? Then how many times a year can you mow it? And it's a big consideration. We know that mowing is probably our most, most uh, st strongest weed control method we have. And then one of the ways I'm encouraging a lot of golf courses to maybe maintain these areas a little better is give these areas peripheral treatment, meaning that areas that are in play could be treated slightly different than areas that are not in play, maybe the first 20 feet off the fairway. And the reason why I mention this is because I've heard many golfers complain to me and superintendents that, hey, I'm one foot into the high grass fescue area. It's worse than being 40 feet in, right? The area 40 feet in that doesn't get irrigation. It doesn't get any fertilizer potentially over the years. That's thinner and easier to play from, from one foot off of the regular primary rough area. So thinking about maybe focusing more on some of this stuff and adjusting irrigation and fertility practices or an extra mowing in those areas, say in April or May, could provide better weed control and allow your herbicides to work better as well. So I want to start with cultural weed control and manual weed control is really something to think about. A drainage is a huge one. Fine fescues in particular do not do well in wet soils. And you, you'll see this many times, you know, if you establish a few acres of this, your areas that are on ridges and tend to dry out or in rocky soils that tend to be a little droughty are generally the best areas on the entire property versus areas where water will run into or springs or areas where water tends to sit. So drainage can be a big one. Uh, water and fertilizer, if you're not already doing these, once fine fescues, all of them, hards, sheeps, creeping, once they are mature, they really require very little fertilizer and water. Now, I don't wanna say that they never do. I have seen fine fescues that have uh, really thinned out and some even die with major drought stress. So you may need a, a, every other year, if you get to periods where you go, say 30 to 45 days on any measurable rainfall, you may need a small amount of, of water to keep the, the crown of the fine fescue plants alive. Now, mowing's a big one, and this is a, a really, a, a very, I don't know, mowing's probably the most important thing we can, we can do to fine fescues. I have a golf course I work with pretty closely that uh, they don't they, they don't want to use a lot of herbicides in their areas, so they'll go through every two or three years, and they, they mow them once a month, and then the following year, they let them grow up. It's impressive just naturally, you know, how much weed control they get that first year if they've taken these areas and, and just mowed them the prior year. So most fine fescues will also stress if it's hot. So that's really something to think about. If you have some heat stress, um, you dr drive a mower through them, drive a tractor through them, or even walk through fine fescues under, uh, under drought stress, you can generally, they'll go into a dormancy period and sometimes they will actually die from that. So you see that many times on golf courses that have walking paths for either caddies or golfers through fine fescues. But basically about two years later, it turns to, to dirt because the fine fescues do not handle that traffic under certain periods. Uh, Autumn is a great time to mow. And then springtime mowing helps with density and seed heads. And I'll show you some photos of this. And then one of the considerations is if you ever tissue tested the clippings of fine fescue, and I've done this a handful of times just to, to prove a point, but generally speaking because they're only mowed you know a few times a year that the nitrogen fertility that's in the fescue clippings is generally very high so if you, if you have four or five percent tissue nitrogen for every hundred pounds of clippings that you let lay on that fine fescue you return a substantial amount of fertility back into them this is not this is not uncommon to see if you cut a fine fescue say in september you get some rainfall and those clippings kind of break down you actually will see the fescue green up about 45 days later many times. And that's due to that recycling of that nutrition. Now, if you have areas that you're trying to keep on the thinner side, one method that we suggest is to typically remove some of that debris when labor is, po is possible to do so. Uh, we see some golf courses contract, you know, hay farmers to cut it and bale it and haul it off. And that's generally something that can be suggested as a, a cultural weed control, as well as an overall cultural practice that does benefit the fescues where and when possible. Uh, it's, it's a funny story here, but you know, I see you know 200 golf courses per year in my travels, and many times I'll make a comment to a superintendent, say, "Man, this is a lot of golf courses in your grass areas, some of the cleanest I've seen." And the superintendent's response is, 
you see those two employees right there, right? That's basically what, what they're saying is that he has people who are basically dedicated to these areas. And, and unfortunately, it, in most climates to have these, you know, wispy and thin and weed free, it takes a lot of, a lot of time and labor. <clears throat> Here's some employees grabbing some American burn weed. You know, really the, the only weed in this is that American burn weed that came in late in the summer. Uh, American burn weed is a summer annual uh, broadleaf plant that rapidly grows pretty quickly in the heat. Now, here's what I mentioned a little earlier about treating areas a little differently with mowing and maybe even herbicides. So what this golf course decided to do is their number one complaint about the high grass areas was this area right here, you know, first 15 feet. So they decided to make two mower passes in early May. And what that would do is it would, one, reduce the seed stalk. We know that mowing these areas later and later in the spring can sometimes mow off the seed stalk. The interesting thing about fine fescue is it tends to only have one seeding period per year, which is a lot different from say Poannua. Poannua might be on many of your minds right now as far as Poa seed head suppression with either proxy or if you still have some embark left. But Poannua, you can basically find seed heads in it maybe 10 months or sometimes 12 months out of the year if you look carefully, right? But fescues, depending on your region, if you're warmer, maybe a little earlier, but typically between April and, and you know middle of, of June in most locations is going the seed then stops. And why mowing during that time frame can impact the seed heads is it's not going to produce a seed stalk, say, in July or August, right? We know that from the biology of, of the fine fescue. So something to think about is if you have these areas, they're still penal. I mean, most golfers are going to tell you that this lie right here is, is unpredictable. It's probably a half a stroke penalty. But this golf course wanted the wispy appearance from the tee boxes and from the clubhouse to still see that vista being. So this is a, a way I'm seeing many golf courses try to treat these areas a little differently. So for example, 15 feet or two mower widths off the uh, regular primary rough area. The other method I'm seeing a, a lot of success with is a, is a super 600 weed amendment. And there's many different vertical cutters that would do this. Ice golf course waits until June when you have good soil moisture, let the seed heads be produced. And they go through with a vertical cutter, set it about six inches. And what this does is it knocks a lot of those seed stalks up but the seed heads off you can see there's actually no seed heads there and this gives that that straw appearance you know from a from the vista standpoint but it's much thinner from the overall playability of these areas so there's lots of ways and this mowing will also help control some weeds we know that uh, but think about the different mowing timings uh, after the seed heads are produced the other big thing is many times i, I will suggest is somebody say hey this mow it six inches once a, a month you know basically may through october and then try to get some, some seed this is an area that ha obviously has some wet spots you can see right here my point about uh, fine fescues don't like it very wet you can basically see where the water collects here in that low spot uh, probably would be best if they want this to be a really good fescue area to install some sort of drainage here but the mowing will reduce the weeds a lot and then you can come back in august september october any of these thin spots try to seed or establish some harder sheep's fescue this is, a, this is actually a um, septic field that uh, the golf course capped with sand. They put fescue sod down on top of the, the sand. This is a, something I mentioned earlier, but it does work when you're siding areas. One of my concerns with this from seed is that this like a, a, a putting green could erode, you know, the sand will, will, will erode away or wash. Um, this is a, you know, a difficult thing to seed fine fescues because fine fescues are typically, they're quick to germinate, but they're very slow to form a turf and fill in uh, to reduce erosion. So many times these areas are solid. This was a leach field from a clubhouse. Uh, turned out pretty well. The other question I get many times, labor concerns is, is goats and sheep as biological weed control, but the rarely have I seen these animals keep these types of modern day standards, but they're useful for out of the way areas, maybe a cool feature on the golf course to have some, some sheep or some goats around. I mean, you can see how weedy this area was and basically the goats were just laying around uh, for my whole half day visit at this golf course, but uh, definitely an interesting thing to think about. I've never seen goats and sheep be able to keep up say modern day herbicides and adequate labor. As much again, fine fescue does not like wet feet. You can see a pretty decent fine fescue stand outside of this drainage swale here. But many, many times these types of areas come, you know, get identified, you know, after the, the fact. So you know, it really was it was a wet area, but you know, tall fescue or bluegrass did find these areas, and they try to establish some fine fescue in there. Uh, when these areas get sprayed with herbicides, they become bare ground because typically there's bent grasses in there or, or other grasses that are, are sensitive to say either fusillade or segment. Here's a photo actually of some more research plots. 
And this co company wanted us to screen some herbicides for fine fescue safety. And we asked the company, say, hey, do you want us to mow it before we, we spray? And the answer was yes. We ended up taking half this fine fescue block. This is this is our Aurora Gold Hard Fescue. It's about 12 year old stand that I have at one of my properties. And you can see on the left there, we mowed it May 15th. And there on the, on the right was mowed April 15th, right? So right's April 15th, left's May 15th. That's what I'm getting at as far as these spring mowings can be an incredible tool if you are having areas that are too thick. Now, all that does is it really produces less seed stalks, right? And then seed production by that later you mow into the, the springtime period. Uh, but really that April 15th or third week of April for most of the mid-Atlantic and, and Northeast, uh, I would say probably the same thing for the central region, it's probably gonna be your cutoff day if you wanna have a kind of that, that that straw colored hue uh, on these areas. The other thing I want to show you a quick photo of here. This is what, you know, this is a, a fine fescue rough at a golf course, but uh, once they get to middle of July on this fine fescue, the rough, they, they have to really stop mowing it because even golf carts, when it gets really hot, the fine fescue will thin out. And this is not uncommon to see uh, with most fine fescues that are grown in, in, in droughty or, or heat, uh, air, droughty soils or hot areas. So logistics of weed control, right? Many of the questions I get surround, you know, these summer annual weeds, foxtails, American burnweed. And the question comes up, Steve, I, I put a high rate of any pre-emerge, whether it's barricade or pendulum or dimension out, you know, in April or May. I don't want to drive through these areas, you know, come June, once they go to seed, I get a lot of late summer weeds, right? And one of the things I've always wondered here is, you know, clippings, are they so dense they prevent a lot of movement of the herbicides down to that target area, that, that upper soil? Uh, I get a lot of questions this time of year, does burning increase my weed control? And it should, right? In theory, you, you could change your weed control spectrum, but maybe getting that herbicide down, you know, onto the soil through burning these areas could be more effect, efficient. One thing I have seen burning do, if you, I know burning cannot be done everywhere, but I have sites that say they can burn half the golf course, but not the other half due to municipality or county or, you know, proximity to houses or buildings. We see a shift that you'll have actually more warm season native plants like little blue stem uh, in areas that you're burning more frequently. So it's interesting. You can see a, a change in the weed spectrum or plant spectrum. Uh, then also, can you take a, a safe, you know, safely spray these areas or will hand spray be required? And then one thing we've seen a lot more recently is these boomless nozzles. I would encourage you to try these areas, at, try these out with boomless nozzles, but make sure you're doing as, as good of a can as calibration. Uh, they seem to be tough to calibrate as uniformly as we want to. I threw this picture here just to show, show, you know, how we have thistle and brambles and, you know, if, if weed control is not performing these areas and they're not being mown on a regular basis, many, many times these areas can, can really get out of control. So uh, it's it's something really to talk about how much labor and time. Uh, here's uh, some hand spray and you know, some yellow nuts edge. Uh, this individual is not following the PPP require, requirements of gloves, uh, but just some spot spray of that. And this is just due to some, some hills. and. One of the logistics of, of having high grass areas that are in these types of areas would be that, that handwork. Now, I want to get into some of the weeds that I commonly see, and I, I can't cover every single weed. You know, if you're in California, if you're in you know, Dakotas, for example, there'd be much differently, but much different weeds than I'm used to on the East Coast. Uh, some of the most common ones that I see, and this is an order of kind of observation in high grass areas, uh, foxtail species. I remember there's a few of those, there's yellow and there's giant, and they behave very similarly. Uh, same herbicides will control you know, all, all those species. Japanese stokegrass is an interesting one. This, this is emerging to be more and more of a problem on golf courses, say in peripheral areas. Japanese stokegrass is a, a very dynamic summer annual grass seaweed in the fact that it tolerates shade much better than most other summer annual grass. We think about you know, crabgrass, how it thrives in you know, open sites, you know, compacted soils for goosegrass and full sun, right? But stokegrass it also gets up much earlier than you think about, and it gets mature, say, in late April and May. If you begin to watch in most climates uh, where Japanese still grass is found, it gets up the you know, first few warmer days, say in, in late March or April. It's one of the earliest summer annuals. And because of that, it actually can be early, easy to miss with pre-emergent herbicides like pendulum or barricade, for example. Uh, third one here is barnyard grass. Uh, fourth one here is joint head arthroxin. I'm gonna show you a photo of this. This is a, a newer invasive weed that I'm seeing throughout the mid-Atlantic. Uh, it likes wetter soils, but definitely can be a, a weed problem uh, in high grass fescue areas. A uh, goosegrass can be a problem in fescue areas, especially if it's an old haul road or the soil is very compacted. 
stay in there, you let it just grow up. I do see some goosegrass be an issue in these, uh, and crabgrass can also be an issue. Now, I mentioned poannua here, and typically when we see poannua as a weed and fine fescue, it's typically the first year or two. And it's usually an older golf course. Let's so say the golf course is more than 30 years old, and they have a, a lot of poannua sea bank in the soil. And what typically happens is you renovate an area with glyphosate or other non-selective herbicides. You seed your fine fescue in there. As the fine fescue is germinating in the fall, some poannua emerges, and then it gives you some problems the following spring. But once you're able to put a pre-emergent herbicide on the fine fescue, say in August or September of the following year, that typically does a, a fantastic job of poannua control in these fine fescue areas. So here's uh, some barnyard grass, you know, in some high grass areas. It typically has this crow's foot seed head that you can very, very easy to tell apart from crabgrass. Here's foxtail on a fine fescue bunker bank. Now here's that weed that I mentioned. This is a, a newer invasive weed that I'm seeing. Uh, Some would have mistaken this for deer tongue grass. Now deer tongue grass does look a lot like joint heterothroxin, but make sure you're identifying these because uh, they're different in their biology. Joint heterothroxin anthroxin is actually a summer annual. Uh, it's not a perennial. So deer tongue grass, which has these long leaves that look like a deer's tongue, is a perennial. Right now, some of the same herbicides, like, like a claim, for example, has activity on joint head, whereas deer tongues also sensitive to a claim as well. So uh, you have some very similar herbicide control measures. Make sure you're identifying these. And the reason reason why I mentioned that is because if you're having trouble with joint head because it's an annual can actually control that better with a pre-emergent early in the spring, whereas deer tongue as a perennial will not be controlled by a pre-emerge. This is what um, joint head anthroxin turns in the fall. It's, just, it's like I mentioned, it's summer annual weed. So very similar Japanese stilkgrass. This gets that, that purple and brown hue with the frost and some shorter days uh, in the late summer. So for control of summer grassy weeds, pre-emergence always best. And uh, when I talk about pre-emergent herbicides, I'm talking on mature fine fescues, right? So some that was maybe seeded in August or September, the following April or May, you should be good. Uh, but consider applications twice a year. And the reason why I think this helps a lot is because of coverage. It's very difficult many times to spray the large open areas of fine fescue or treed areas that you have to navigate through trees, right? So autumn followed by spring is best. And I, I typically recommend the rotation. For example, if say you want to do barricade in the spring, you could do pendulum or dimension, say in the fall as an example. And the other big challenge about these is, is herbicides, as we know, need to be watered in. So as soon as possible, after mowing in the spring, for example, and prior to a rainfall, would be the optimal time to do this, especially if you don't have irrigation in these areas. If some of your weed concerns are late summer germinating annuals, the other thing to think about here is pushing that, that spring applied herbicide back as late as possible. Uh, for example, late April, early May. And the, the risk of, of moving that, that herbicide application back, whether you're driving a tractor through there with a granular or you're driving a sprayer through there is, is the tracks, right? So I've seen superintendents get very creative where they'll, they'll drive in a direction where Golfers typically aren't seen from a tee box, right? That's one way to alleviate some of the tr tracks. But I always question, I say, what's worse, you know, having all these weeds in these areas or the tire tracks, right? So it's a, I know it's going to be a golf course by golf course decision, but if you're struggling with these late summer germinating annual grasses like foxtail or barnyard grass, uh, pushing the application back could, could be a, a big benefit. Now, winter annual grasses, I, I see, I mentioned Poe annual already here, but uh, two, other two are rat tail fescue, which I'll show you a photo of, and then downy broom. Many times, as I mentioned, that if you are struggling with these winter annual grasses in fine fescue, <clears throat> typically at late summer, uh, pre-emergent herbicide can be very effective. Here's Poe annual and some fine fescue. This would be an area you can see, it's, it's pretty immature. You see the voids down there. Uh, it's first year fine fescue that was, was seeded in September. The Poe annual germinated along with it. The poanium goes to seed in April, May, and early June, and then it kind of crap, craps out and dies. Now, rat, to, rat, rat tail fescue is a really interesting weed challenge in high fescue grass areas. And the, the seed growers tell me that they're seeing more and more rat tail fescue in their fine fescue fields in the Pacific Northwest uh, when they stopped burning the fields and they stopped, you know, using that burning as a, as a key to uh, control and vegetation, they see more rat tail. And rat tail is very similar to most sheeps and hard fescues. Uh, it's very difficult to tell the appearance of them until till the first spring. 
What ends up happening here, you see these clumps. This, this, this is rat tail here. This is hard fescue here. This is rat tail. And what happened was is <clears throat> there's a lot of seed that has contamination of rat tail in there. Now, a rat tail is a winter annual, meaning that it only lives one year, but it dies in response to summertime heat. So essentially that first year we have a lot of rat tail in the, the fine fescue, uh, it's gonna be controlled the following year by that pre-emerge in late summer, uh, or it's the fine fescue is naturally gonna outcompete that to a point uh, where it's not an issue. So some pre-emergent options, right? We have a, a few of these here. Uh, Barricade, uh, if you wanna use full label rate for sure. Uh, Pendulum Aquacap, or we abbreviate that Pendy. One thing with Pendulum in particular is it has the highest potential to stain stuff. Uh, a few years ago, I had a client spray their high grass areas uh, with Pendulum in the spring on the same morning. They had a, a dog walking party through there uh, and stained some shoes and some dog's feet. So definitely a concern uh, if you are gonna use that material. It's a great herbicide, but that's one of the nuances. Uh, Ditherapy or dimension, plenty of formulations of the Ditherapy in the marketplace. Uh, really, it's not safe to apply to immature fescue. I've seen dimension applied to first year fescue plots, but they won't go to seed the whole entire first and second year. So it does thin them out. So it uh, does not do much to mature fine fescue, although if you read the dimension label in detail, it does mention some cultivars and some sensitivity to some fine fescues on the label. Uh, they must have picked up on that in development of dimension that had some sensitivity issues when it was immature in particular. Now, Ronstar is not labeled. Uh, a newer option we're messing around with still is SureGuard, it's Flumioxum. This is best used when the fine fescue is dormant and to, to dry, dry turf, right? Uh, there's some other formulations that have Flumioxum in there like SurePower, uh, but still figuring this one out and it can thin fescues, right? We have seen that, especially if it's actively growing. So uh, SureGuard is definitely one we're looking at. I'm sure some people on here probably messed with that or used or using that, but uh, my 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 general rule of thumb is you want it to be dormant <clears throat> in the fall or the early early spring. So keys with uh, pre-emergent herbicide, uh, if possible, more in the mow in the spring, uh, time with light rainfall, and then try to get as good as coverage as possible. Uh, many times you'll see some some triangles or some skips in these areas. Now onto annual broadleaf weeds, and once again, this is a class that's going to germinate. And, and not survive in a full year. Uh, most common ones I see would be American burnweed, various ragweed, pigweed, uh, various knotweed, and then PA smartweed. And that there's all types of other ones. I have, I have many others there. Just realize that many of these broadleaf weeds, <clears throat> you can really have, use some of these new apps on your phone to get really good identification of them and, and, and figure out what herbicides are, are best for them. And uh, I have an app on my phone I use quite frequently you know, when I'm consulting or, or hiking and I look at broadleaf weeds and I'm like, man, what is this? Or I think it's this. So there's some pretty good things there. And the other thing I wanna mention is Gallery uh, is a pretty strong pre-emergent for summer annual broadleaf weeds and Gallery is not labeled in New York state if you have anybody from New York on, on the webinar. Now here's American burnweed. This has become one of the, the biggest problems in recent years throughout the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. So I'm sure some of the folks in the Central, or maybe even out West are seeing some of this, but uh, it looks like a mixture of ground soil and dandelion. It's very upright. Uh, it's a prolific seeder and the seeds look almost like dandelion pods, but they're, they're larger uh, like ground soil and it has these, these wind dispersed seeds. And if you have an infestation of that, you'll, you'll see the seeds that disperse and that's next year's crop. So it's a, it's a pretty, pretty prolific plant. Now, most common perennial broadleaf weeds, and when I mean perennial, now I'm talking about, you know, broadleaf weeds that survive for more than one season. If you let, let them uncontrolled, you're going to have much more issues with, with them in the future. So some of the most common ones I see would be Canada thistle, uh, various clovers, poison ivy, uh, brambles, like multiflora rose. I realize many of these, like poison ivy and brambles and woodies, are, are best controlled through mowing. Uh, we see some crown vetch, and like I said, many others. It can be region or even golf course specific. Here's crown vetch. It's actually a golf course in western Pennsylvania. Uh, this was actually an old site that was used for some soil reclamation, and uh, they had a lot of vetch in the soil that they used for soil stabilization. Uh, so you see vetch on some highways from time to time, and typically it's, it's a weaker perennial broadleaf, but it can be very invasive and take over some fine fescues. Uh, vetch is very sensitive to a lot of different herbicides, uh, very pretty easy to control, but it does tend to be an issue for a few years uh, when it gets established. 
So broadly, if we control an fescue high grass areas, there's hundreds of options here. And really it's gonna be whatever you feel comfortable with or whatever you have used in the past or if economics are a big issue, whatever you can get within your budget, right? You need to consider you know, mixing, if you're gonna to try to kill broadleaf weeds like, and, and, and use fusillate or segment or a claim, you cannot mix 2,4-D MCPP or MCPA with segment. So what I'm trying to get out here is if you're using these tank mixes of a, of a grassy weed herbicide like segment or fusillate with say a, a 2,4-D product, you're probably getting reduced grassy weed control. It doesn't turn it off entirely, but there is some, some antagonism. So you, you wanna be careful there. So I'll mention this in a little more detail here later, but the conventional 2,4-D, MCPP and MCPA and dicamba mixes like Trimec and others, uh, straight dicamba is pretty common in a lot of places, you know, uh, Vanquish. Uh, one of my personal favorites is, is Confront uh, or 2D of the 32 ounces breaker, uh, Speed Zone and T Zone. Uh, and native, or excuse me, uh, Sure Power and Native Clean, we're, we're still doing a lot more work on these. Uh, remember, with Native Clean, uh, there's a buffer for some trees, and Sure Power has Flumioxin, which is Sure Guard, in there for a post margin. One thing we've seen with Sure Power is, you, when possible, apply it to a dry canopy. I not have a heavy dew. Now on to the most difficult weeds to control. And I wish these were easier to control, but they're tough. And we're talking about perennial grassy weeds here, right? And um, there's many of these. These can also be very site specific, right? Uh, quack grass and orchard grass and Bermuda grass are probably the three most common ones that uh, I see in my travels up and down the East Coast and in Central Central US. Uh, you can also have some past palums like Dallas grass, or uh, there's a few past palums around. A dwarf found grass can actually be a pretty big issue uh, where it escapes from, say, flower beds and gets in the high grass areas. Uh, one of the worst dwarf found grass outbreaks I've ever seen was a uh, golf course that had a lot of dwarf found grass around their clubhouse. And they told me they just cut it down every winter and, and disposed of the, the, the grass and the seed heads back in their high grass areas. And then in the spring, they mowed over it. And remember, those seed heads from dwarf found grass are, are very viable. Uh, the herbicide Quinclorac Drive is actually a very strong dwarf fountain grass herbicide. If you, if you do have issues with that in your fine fescues, now, I put little and big blue stem here, and I put when it's too thick. Uh, I'm a, a huge fan of little blue stem. It's, it's beautiful, but uh, it can get really thick, especially for areas that are in play and then become a weed, right? A plant out of place. Uh, bent grass, tall fescue, canary grass, and then some other perennial grassy weeds can all be issues uh, in high fescue areas. Here's quack grass, and there's a pretty aggressive cool season grass that can take over if uh, left uncontrolled. And this will also take, you know, I say three to four applications a year if you want to get really good control in the first year. Uh, it's going to take some time to get the quack grass out of an area like this. And the biggest one here is the, the quack grass has these rhizomes, right? And very difficult, you know, when you're trying to think about controlling a, a perennial plant that has these rhizomes, it, it's going to be two to four applications per year of either fusillade. Uh, or se segment cethoxidum uh, for perennial grassy weed control. Now, so we control in fescues. These are mostly all what they call ACC ACE inhibiting herbicides. And that's an enzyme, uh, but it's basically segment and fusillator that only safe on poannua and fine fescues. These are what we call niche herbicides. And you really want to be very careful with overlap into your rough or even runoff and very, very sensitive to bent grass, right? So if you have, you know, bent grass fairways or tees, uh, putting greens very close to these areas. Uh, now, fusillade two, our rates are 16 to 20 ounces per acre. Some people do go higher. There's a pretty high level of safety here. Uh, there's two formulations of segment or cethoxidum on the marketplace. Uh, the older formulation, which is regular segment, the use rate there was 36 ounces per acre. Uh, newer formulation of segment two and at 16 to 20 ounces per acre. Now, other options for grassy weed control and fescues. And for years, I feel like many people felt that fine fescues were not herbicide tolerant. And reality is we're getting a lot of comfort with them the past 15 years or so. And we're finding they're actually very herbicide tolerant to a whole separate category of herbicides that really never thought about even using on, you know, bluegrass or ryegrass or tall fescue. So a claim extra is very strong herbicide for deer tongue grass and Bermuda suppression. 
One thing with phenoxaprop or acclaim is you want to mix that with Turflon or Confront to, to boost that grassy weed control, as well as you can get broadleaf weed control from that. Uh, safest material for, for grassy weed control close to bluegrass or tall fescue. What I'm getting at here is because acclaim is very safe on a lot of other cool season grass species like bluegrass and tall fescue, um, it's not safe on Bermuda. It is safe on Georgia, ironically. Uh, but you have some ability to get right in that edge, right? That tends to be the interface between the fine fescue and say a, a cool season rough uh, where fusillator segment could, could do some damage. Second option I have on this one is, is tropamazone or pilex. That's uh, one to one and a half ounces per acre. Uh, this boosts a lot of your grassy weed control and best to use repeat applications. Um, tank mix with turflon or confront will also boost control as well as reduce the bleaching. Now dry, which is quinclorac, uh, very safe on fine fescues and very strong on deer tongue and foxtail. One of the biggest suggestions I have, if I leave one thing in your mind today with, with these herbicides is all these grassy weed herbicides need good soil moisture to work. And for example, the spring of 2021, last spring, maybe 10, 11 months ago, throughout much of the mid-Atlantic, central and northeast regions, we had basically a, a month with no rainfall. And it was very difficult for me as a consultant to make suggestions to put herbicides targeting grassy weeds in, in fine fescues, for example. So uh, really think about that, is especially if these are unirrigated areas. And superintendents, I feel, come to me and, and talk about this. They're, they're frustrated with weed control in their fescues, and they're trying to use herbicides when there's no good soil moisture, right? So trying to time that after a rainfall event, for example, uh, could be a good way to boost some of your, your weed control. A uh, mix of the surfactant, either non is or, or methylated seed oil in best case. And then if you are spot spraying, remember, a claim in particular, you want to get as good as coverage as possible. So sometimes I feel like some of the backpacks are not, you know, the small droplet size. If you are spot spraying, uh, use a, a, a fine droplet when possible. Most of these grassy weed herbicides in particular require excellent coverage and fine droplets. This is a quick photo that shows what um, an overspray of, of fusillade or segment can do to a dormant bentgrass fairy where the boom hit it last autumn. And it probably is going to be very slow to break dormancy. Remember, both fusillade and segment are not safe on bentgrass or bluegrass. Here's just another angle of that same photo. So the sprayer here was trying to go up the hill there, and a boom came on with fusillade on that edge. Here's another, another photo of fescue area. Uh, you can clearly see the poannua here in the center of that, that rough was unaffected by fusillade or segment. Uh, does injure all cool season grasses. So I get this question quite a bit about this buffer between the regular cool season rough and the fine fescue rough. And one of the suggestions I typically have is to err on the inside. And if you have to mow that six inch buffer there to keep weeds out of it, uh, you can come back in and mow that say a few weeks later. And also be very careful with, with any of these herbicides, if you apply them to thin areas where soil could move or, or rock. Uh, there was a situation where the herbicides were applied, heavy, heavy rainfall fell the night after the application, and bentgrass fairies were damaged by the herbicide. So be very careful. If there's nothing to uptake that herbicide and it's not going to dry very well, it could be an issue for, for runoff. The other weed I want to mention as far as grassy weed control uh, is little blue stem. Uh, if it's becoming a weed, meaning a plant out of place, right? Here's an area between a T and a fairway that you could argue, ah, it's pretty thick. We're, we're going to get held up here finding golf balls. Uh, we've done a lot of work that shows that MSMA, which can still be spot sprayed on golf courses in most states, uh, one fluid ounce per thousand square feet plus triclopyr uh, can be used to suppress it. So they typically want to do that June through September. Remember, like Bermuda grass and Georgia grass, many of these herbicides that they're sprayed on brown, a dormant little blue stem has little to no effect, right? So uh, I see a lot of golf courses interested in trying to thin out some of their blue stem and this herbicide mixture right here can do it. Uh, some people spot spray the clumps uh, with an unselective at green up too, and that, that can be very effective. Now, a question I get many times here is that, you know, um, there's lots of options to tank mix. And typically when you're taking time to go spray a fescue area, you want to get as much done as you can. Uh, I don't, don't want to, you know, pick on products here or make some suggestions because there's, there's lots of ways to do this, right? So in a mature fine fescue, for example, where seeding is not needed or not done, you can go out in the spring 
And depending on where you are, that could be between now and say May 15th, depending on you know where you, how far north you are. But a barricade plus gallery plus confront, fusillade, this would be a very high value area, a very expensive herbicide combination, but would probably provide very high levels of weed control. Once, a, once again, there's many ways to get this done, right? Then in the summertime, you could spot spray with say fusillade plus turf lump, plus if you have some sedge, you know, you use Vexus, so I'll mention this here a little bit, um, uh, Halosophiron, Pro Sedge. Now, if you don't need the fusillade, you can use a, a three or four way herbicide like Speed Zone, for example. But uh, you don't want to mix 2,4-D or any product that contains 2,4-D with fusillade or segment. Then in the autumn, I'm leaving it wide open. Say you switch back to Pendulum, and if you have pretty clean areas and maybe just some broadleaf weeds, you can go out with another, you know, another material like straight. Uh, Triclopyr, for example, or you, know, you have plenty of options there. So this is a very common way to treat these areas. Uh, we, we've tested these out. I've seen many golf courses do them with, with zero issues on turf uh, phytotoxicity. Now, the last week category before I get to some of the PGR stuff today is, is sedge control. And we're definitely seeing more pressure from sedges in high grass fescue areas. I'm not sure if that's wet or summers that we're experiencing or that, that little bit increase in temperature. Uh, but realize many of the herbicides that you spray on regular grasses for, for sedges will be safe and fine fescues. Uh, most common are wet spots. So typically what, what I, why I mentioned that is you can maybe spot spray these areas. Uh, herbicides are best to apply before the sedge gets really mature. I would say if you can get your sedge controlled by the middle of July, you're gonna have a much better and cleaner stand and also better coverage. So we have plenty of options here. Hallow Soft Iran, which goes by Pro Sedge, Manage, or Sedge Hammer, uh, Mazda Soft Iran, Solero, uh, Soft Entrazone, which is Dismiss, a very strong uh, herbicide, actually high levels of tolerance at those rates, you know, four to six ounces per acre uh, in fine fescues. And then a newer one we've done a lot of work with the past few years is Vexus. Uh, Vexus can be spot treated in the spring. It's all soil active. It's actually a granular material. And since you know many times these sedges are perennials, as well as you know they're, they're spot, they're, they're in various spots, not wholesale. Say like uh, you know a quack grass or foxtails can be. Uh, you could potentially go in in May with a granular application of Vexus and get a pretty good uh, sedge control from that as well. I want to mention a little bit about renovating areas and how best, in my opinion, to start over. Uh, here was a, a joke a superintendent made. You know, he, he had tried fine fescues for years and they didn't do well. And then he decided that the golf course needed to start over with them and, you know, renovate them for, with Roundup and, and reseed them. So if you have significant populations of, of perennial grassy weeds like Bermuda grass and quack grass, this is actually number two, a congressional before the big renovation on two blue. Uh, that, that rough was really dominated by uh, Bermuda grass. And we knew they were going to be putting some fine fescues in as far as Andrew Green's master plan. And uh, they did a good job trying to eradicate as much Bermuda grass prior to all the establishment, even bent grass and fine fescues in particular. Give yourself a, a good foot up. Uh, so my renovation strategy is typically fusillade or segment plus glyphosate in late July, early August. And I come back with at least two more applications of straight glyphosate. Uh, people don't, don't want to wait, but the key with this application, if you have these difficult to control perennials, is to give the plants a chance to green back up and then spray more glyphosate. Uh, people also try in some straight fusillade uh, due to some concerns over glyphosate. And I understand all that, but I realize that mixture in the first application is the strongest I've seen. Uh, this takes some patience. And then the key with fine fescues is you want to get the seed in the ground prior to one October. Basically, uh, late August through middle of September is the best, but this is almost like closing the window where if you don't get the f fine fescue seeds in the ground by 1st of October in most climates, you're probably looking at a two or three year time frame for establishment. The other big thing here is I'm a big fan with tenacity in the seed bed for control of winter annuals. Now, spring seeded fine fescues is something I get a lot of questions about. I realize that a spring seeded fine fescue is going to be a, a very big challenge to get it up and, and, and mature within the, you know, even 18 months, it's probably going to, need to be reseeded again in the fall. But uh, really, that's my best kind of game plan here for renovation of these areas. So we control these areas, as I mentioned a couple of times already, Poe Annual, as you see here, is typically the biggest weed challenge on a lot of older properties. So this was an area that was treated with a non-selective herbicide a few times, uh, hard fescue seed was cut into it, and then you see the Poe Annual emerging. Another big question I get about establishment is this purpling that we see many times in, in, in fine fescue seeds. 
seedings, right? And I would encourage you, if you have some high value areas, it's probably worth sending a soil sample out to either local, local consultant or a local university. And uh, let's make sure that these areas, this is a subsoil, you can see a lot of renovation here. The soil was actually moved and graded. Uh, make sure your, your soil phosphorus levels are greater than 25 parts per million, maybe like three extraction. This was the soil that responded incredibly or a stand of fine fescue and establishment that was low in phosphorus, a small amount of pea was applied uh, and the, the stand greened up immediately. And uh, it was really shocking to see that. So many times I feel like uh, these areas are old, you know, uh, treat areas or, or areas that were neglected with fertilizer for many years. And uh, something to think about, it can be important for establishment. Now, once that, that turf is mature, that fine fescue is probably gonna be sustainable for quite some time without minimal fertility. Here's a photo, interesting story. This, this whole entire area was seeded the same day. The area on the left was a bent grass fairway that was sod stripped. And the area on the right here was just native soil that was seeded into, it was spread with Roundup and then seeded. So poannual was always an issue in that first year sp the spring. And tenacity can help with poannual control. It's not great for, for poa, nothing really is in this scenario. But as I mentioned, many times poannual is only an issue in the first year with, with fine fescues. The other thing I would encourage you too is a lot of the times these areas are sloped and using some matting or hydro seeding of slopes can really help. The other suggestion I have as far as establishment is some people, I've seen this many times in our, in our plot work as well, will include oats or some sort of other cover crop to reduce the erosion uh, on, on, on slopes. And that, that oats is not going to be an issue long term. You can pull it out uh, with herbicides or even some, some mowing, say, the following year. There's just some photos of some, some winter annuals going back into a, a seeded area, uh, fine fescue. So kind of run that down again, kill the area, glyphosate roundup, uh, first application, two more glyphosates, uh, and then try to get the seed in the ground before October 1st, and then at seeding, use mesotrium. Uh, the following year in April or May, as long as that fine fescue turf is about two inches high, it should be very tolerant to pendulum. Uh, we've done a lot of trial work that showed pendulum is actually the safest option in, in first year fine fescues. So there's just a photo of some hard fescue seed and then some hydro seeding. The last two slides here before we, we wrap up, but some golf courses are having what I call designated weedy areas. And this has been a method to allow best of both worlds where you, you take areas that are way out of play. You say, okay, we're going we're to allow pollinators or milkweed to survive here. And we're only going to control, say, invasive weeds, maybe by spot treatment or by removal, or we're only going to mow them when absolutely needed to. And this is a way I think a lot of clubs have had some success with, uh, you know, really making some folks happy as far as, you know, not controlling the milkweed and um, really gives a, a political um, kind of foresight to say, hey, we had these areas that were designated for that exact purpose. So I want to wrap up with this my last few minutes here is, uh, I get a lot of questions, and I, I personally see this in my, my own visits, is, you know, density management. Once again, consider your goals here, but we know plant growth regulators are very effective to reduce overall height and even seed heads, right? Proxy, for example. Most of the time, these PGRs need to be applied in the spring, so usually April and May. Now, I've seen a lot of people look at mechanical thinning, like vertical mowing, say, in the fall aggressively uh, or the wintertime. The other thing I've seen, and you probably have seen this if you've been managing these for quite some time, is there's some herbicides like Tower, which is dimethenamide and Turflon, that can impact seed heads when applied in the spring months. Tower, actually, I've seen many times in some trial work where if you spray Tower in the spring, uh, it's a herbicide labeled for goosegrass and other weeds. It's, it stunts the fine fescue to a point where it doesn't go to seed that, that calendar year, for example. So be very careful with some of these Thinning herbicides, turf lines, a, a PGR type action. Uh, we've done a lot of work here with, with using various PGRs uh, for this application. This is an old photo that I took, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, some plot work I did on a golf course. This is when Embark was still on the marketplace. And you can see here's Embark plus Roundup. This is a, a site of Roar Gold GT Hard Fescue. And that GT stands for glyphosate tolerant, right? This is a, a variety of hard fescue. They, they picked up on in the nursery business that when they're spraying trees with it um, in the rows, they had very good sense of tolerance to glyphosate. Now it was only tolerant to about a pint per acre, right? So not very high rates, 
But you can see that you can mechanically, or excuse me, chemically thin these out when relative to the untreated plot here. So Embark and Proxy Plus Primo are very effective. One might actually argue that this Proxy Plus Primo here and here maybe be too thin, okay? Uh, so we've done a lot of work with this and I have some photos of some golf courses doing this. Uh, but really here's a, a kind of a, a testament to this. There's a golf course that the applicator had segment in the tank and it did not want to get on the towards the cart path where there was a buffer of some bluegrass and tall grass, tall fescue. So we, we see this quite a bit where five ounces per thousand square feet of proxy plus 20 ounces of primo late last week of April, this was applied. And our observations are slightly reduces the density. You still find a golf ball, an advanced golf ball. Uh, once again, though, this is another input into these areas that we historically tried to be these areas of, of less input. So it's difficult to think about that, but in certain situations, uh, these PGRs applied in April and May can be very effective to reduce the overall height of the fine fescue as well as the overall density. My, la my last few slides here, I'll kind of wrap up with this, but I am seeing some, some really interesting things with insect pests in fine fescues. Um, now, I'm not a trained entomologist, but I dabble quite a bit in, in the bug world. So, you know, it's it's kind of tough because we're not irrigating these areas and you wouldn't suspect that you would see, you know, major outbreaks of chinch bug or white grubs in these areas, but they do damage them. And I, I wouldn't advise like a wholesale annual use of, say, a, a merit or an arena or a cellar in these areas. But you, you probably should scout these areas more than you think so for insect pests, right? So chinch bugs, you can find them and treat for them with a pyrethroid or a neonicotinoid. I remember a cell pretty much will provide season long white grub control can be applied in April and May, along with some of those herbicides I previously mentioned. So you have some flexibility there. Uh, once again, the cost of these areas goes up, but this superintendent in particular argued with me, he said, Steve, the weeds came into the areas where the grubs were at these areas, as well as I'm gonna have to reseed and water and think about all the inputs with that. And at this particular situation, I was definitely worthwhile putting an insecticide out for these uh, in the springtime uh, or go back in and say a granular material. One thing we see with a lot, lot of white grubs is they tend to return to the same spots every year. So maybe if you're having some, some pockets of certain species of white grubs in these fine fescue areas that you treat those pockets uh, and really try to put, re reduce the inputs uh, long-term. So I got four minutes early. I got going a little quickly there, but um, thank you for joining us. And I'm happy to take some questions via chat. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Um, we appreciate you teaching this for us today. I also want to say you really touched on the labels and the rates and what can be used and what can't. And I always love that because Hava makes me say the label is the law. And that's right. You have to know what you can use where and especially some of that tank, tank mixing stuff. So if you have questions, raise your hand now or type into the question answer box. For your education points, you will enter this code 999 Two four one seven seven three one nine nine five on the GCSA website. When you log in, there's a pull down, has your profile. You, that's one of the things that you can access there. You will see if you've been doing this for a while for different regional and chapter events. The nine 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 code is now pre-populated, so if you have trouble typing in, that could be why. So two four one seven seven. 31995. If you're listening to the recording, put in the date you're listening, not our original presentation date. Steve, what is your opinion on soil disruption during renovation? Phrase mode to remove seed bank or does it create more weeds? Best to just use herbicide. It's a good question. So as I showed in that photo there, certain weeds like poanio, we know survive better in the upper inch of soil, right? Now you could expose other weed seeds, foxtail or crabgrass, you know, at various levels. So uh, I think it's a combination of both of those. My, 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 my true opinion, phrase mowing or some disturbance and then some herbicides on top. Uh, you know, in agriculture, they have a lot of success to begin to see what farmers do is, you know, they'll spray an unselective herbicide on a field and they till it, and let it sit for a few weeks before they plant it, right? And that's basically allowing that soil, the weeds that have been brought up. Now in turf, we don't have that luxury many times because we're rushing to reestablish the grass and get it look good as soon as possible. But it kind of puts it in the perspective that in agriculture, that, that same you know technique works where they, you know, will do a combination of, of chemical and tillage. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What are some of the best examples of tall fescue, of fescue tall grass areas that you've seen? Oh, I've seen a lot. <laughs> that this one here is um, this is a, a beacon hard fescue. This one right here on that photo uh, on my question slide. That's at a golf course in, in Montgomery County, Maryland, and uh, it's pretty mature. They, they've since this point here gone through done a lot, lot of thinning this area out, but um, you know. It, Fine fescues generally do really well with 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 inputs, and and if you don't put the inputs into them, they're going to be thin, or they're going to be going to be weedy and too thick, right? So, um, yeah, there's lots of rise. I personally like from establishment either a hard, mostly mostly at least 85% hard, uh, and then some sheeps for most of the climates I, I work in. Uh, the most of the ones that are available today on the marketplace are, are pretty good. Excellent. Okay, I do want to mention we have a number of other upcoming live webinars. Fred Yelverden is going to talk about goose grass. John Fesch is going to talk about doing some planning to lower costs for your trees, shrubs, and flowers as we head towards spring. Um, Don Garrett, who's a CGCS and has been doing this for quite a while, is going to pass along some of his knowledge. And then Chase Straw is going to talk about reducing your water. We all know water and costs for that um, is becoming more of an issue. Um, okay, next question. What's the better method of application when newly establishing over POA annua, drop seed or hydro seed? I would probably hydro seed in that scenario. The other thing I didn't mention it, you know, um, hydro seed can be very useful because it tends to re require less water than, say, a drop seed or a slice seed in there. So, you know, if you have the areas where you're trying to establish fine fescues without irrigation, that's typically a, a good a good thought there. Uh, obviously, we know poanua thrives in irrigated, you know, establishments of fine fescue. So, as you irrigate them more, the poanua is going to gain a, a bigger foothold on it as well. So, and any way you can reduce that that water need uh, through hydro seeding, probably the better way. Okay, you mentioned an app that you use for weed identification. What is that, please? I tried to think of it while I was talking, Lisa. I use uh, an app called Picture This. Yeah, I've used that out in the desert when we were hiking to try and identify some uh, plants that were out there. Yep. Um, okay, so we had San Diego show. Um, it was fun. If you didn't do your evaluation, you can still do that. But we also have requests for proposals open now. So think about sharing your knowledge, kind of like what Don Garrett's going to do with um, that upcoming webinar. We also have Environmental Leaders in Golf Awards open and would love to have more of you uh, submit for that. Uh, four different categories now. If you haven't looked at that for a while, it's a good way to get your hard work and the work that has been done on your golf course uh, more visible. And uh, that's always a good thing, right? Get not acknowledged for your hard work. I am not seeing any other questions here, Steve. Did great. you have any other closing remarks today? That's it. Hopefully everybody has a great 2022. Thank you. Yes, hopefully so. Spring is going to be here soon, really. <laughs> a lot of back and forth right now. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks again, Steve, for presenting, and to PBI Gordon for making this event possible. We'll see you all online again soon. Have a great Thank day, everybody. Thank you, Lisa.